week before last, I was in Cornwall on holiday, and we always go to the same place. The space is familiar. We can instantly relax. And this time, we didn't even do day trips. We literally just walked on the beach, ate and slept. Along with my crochet, which of course I always pack, I packed some books as well. A couple of easy reading, theological ones, an exciting thriller by one of my favourite authors, and a more gentle novel recommended by a friend. I chose the easy reading novel because the blurb told me of a feel-good, uplifting plot, and that's what I got. This week's Gospel reading seems to be about a walk into Jerusalem, with Jesus making educational comments along the way. He sounds, on the face of it, grumpy and irritable, doesn't he? His overnight accommodation has fallen through, and the annoying people tagging along are coming out with flippant and silly comments. But the blurb is misleading. We are actually in the middle of a rip-roaring blockbuster, full of pacey narrative. It's worth glancing back a bit, because in this one chapter, Jesus has given the twelve authority over demons and diseases. He tells them to hit the road with nothing in their pockets, and Herod is hot on their heels. Jesus has fed 5,000 men, plus the wives, and the children with two lo with five loaves and two fish. Peter has confessed Christ's identity as the Messiah. Jesus has told the disciples that he's going to be rejected, killed, and that he will be resurrected, and that they must still follow him. He's taken Peter, James, and John to the top of a mountain where he's transfigured with Moses and Elijah in blazing light before their eyes. He heals a boy possessed with a demon. He reads the disciples' minds and with his hand on the shoulder of a child tells them that the least of all is the greatest. And all that happens in one chapter. This is not a gentle, heartwarming novel. This is a heady mixture of stories that are thrilling, prophetic, hopeful, and yet also frightening, unsettling, and sometimes mystifying. So when Jesus says, let's go to Jerusalem, make no mistake, he is deliberately heading to the right place at the right time for a set purpose. Whether the disciples realized it at the time is another matter. Jesus sends them ahead to get a room and a meal, but they're turned away. It's not just bad manners, because there was real tension. The Samaritans believed in the God of Israel and claimed to be true heirs, but rejected the history of Israel after the time of Joshua. As well as the Ten Commandments, they had added an eleventh one, to worship on Mount Gerizim. However, unfortunately, the Jews had destroyed the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim, so no wonder there was really strong bad feeling. Jesus never did anything by accident. He sent the disciples into a difficult situation to make a point, to expose them to challenges that they would face in the future. So how did the disciples respond? Well, brothers James and John, who you may remember had the nickname Sons of Thunder, remembered Elijah calling down fire from heaven to demonstrate his authority as a man of God. And they wanted to do the same. Remember, in recent days, they had seen Jesus before miracles and signs and wonders. So they were probably thinking, how dare their Lord and Master be rejected by the Samaritans? But isn't that what Jesus warned them would happen? So, Jesus rebukes the brothers, and they move on to another village. And as they travel, they bump into others, as you do. 
So that kind of made me look back at my own recent travels to compare notes with Jesus. Not to compete, just out of interest. So in Cornwall, I had a nice chat with a lady in a charity shop about how to keep our dogs cool in hot weather. On my way to Sweden by train, I had a rather hilarious encounter with two Americans on a platform in Germany where we only had one 50 cent piece to enable eight of us to use the toilet. Also, attempts to acquire a decent cup of tea seem to feature quite often. But when Jesus goes travelling, there's no small talk. Someone comes up to him and makes a bold statement, I will follow you wherever you go. So can you picture a man trotting after Jesus, all enthusiastic and well-meaning? An aside, just to keep us on our toes, the Greek word here, altos, is not gender specific. Could have been a woman, just say. So he or she, in the role of student, has chosen Jesus as their teacher and pays him the compliment of announcing their choice in front of everyone, a public statement of commitment. This was the way things were usually done. Teachers relied on pupils to approach them. But Jesus turned and said, Foxes and birds have places to call home, but it's not so with the Son of Man. There is no safe place. Life will be mobile and challenging. We don't know what the people chose to do, but the appropriate cultural response of the time, when you were warned of difficulties, was to follow your teacher anyway. And so the journey continues, with or without them. Jesus sees somebody else and asks them to simply follow me. And the person says, first, let me go and bury my father. It's not quite as simple as it appears to our 21st century eyes. It usually fell to the eldest son to bury his father. But if the father had just died, the son would not have been out walking. He would have been with a rabbi making arrangements. Some theologians suggest that what the son is actually saying is, let me go and look after my father as instructed in the law of Moses until he dies, which is actually asking to delay things, potentially for several years. Another option is that the son is asking to attend the reburial of his father's bones, which traditionally happened one year after the death of the father. Either way, he's asking for a delay that Jesus isn't willing to grant. And that, in itself, is shocking. As caring for one's parents came second only to your obligation to God Almighty. So who is Jesus saying that he is? And then comes traveller number three, who says that they will follow Jesus but wants to say their goodbyes first. Jesus says to him, or her, that no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What has ploughing got to do with saying goodbye to your family? Well, Jesus is reminding us of Elijah calling Elisha. Elisha was ploughing at the time that he was called and he had a big team of oxen 12 of them, showing that he was a rich man and he was giving up a great deal. He was allowed to give a farewell party before faithfully following Elijah, as we heard in our Old Testament reading, until Elijah was whisked off into heaven in a whirlwind accompanied with chariots and horses of fire. We too are called by Christ to follow Jesus knows that we have obligations to our families, to our employers, to friends. We have places to go and people to see. In good times and in bad, he invites us. He says, follow me. In sickness and in health, he says, follow me. Every morning when you wake, when you open your eyes, 
Jesus calls you and says, follow me. The blurb on the back of a book is written after the writing is complete. Glancing at the cover might give us a hint of the content. Flicking through the pages might give us a few clues. But the blurb is there to tell us all that we need to know to choose whether to read it or whether to put it back on the shelf. If Jesus is the word of God, the way we live our lives is the blurb of his story. So I leave you with a question to reflect on. Does your life reflect the true nature of the word that we follow and are we worthy of being on the back cover? Amen. Notice time, everyone. Don't worry, not many. Just a reminder, and I'm sure you don't need a reminder, that next Saturday afternoon, Matthew will be ordained deacon at Christ Church Cathedral, Oxford. Now, the service is going to be shown here in church at 1.45. So if you wish to be here, please do come along and watch the service live here in church. Now next Sunday, we are going to be having a joint service at 10 a.m. to welcome Matthew as our curate. We will have coffee afterwards and then we're going to have a barbecue lunch. Everyone is welcome. It would be so lovely to see as many as possible there next Sunday. We do need to know numbers, so can you please sign up on the um, uh, at the board there? Otherwise, if you can't make your mind up today, please let Julie know tomorrow in the office because it would be really good to have numbers early on in the week, so that we know how many we're catering for. And also, if you could let us know if you could bring a salad or a dessert, that would be wonderful. And I ask you to please pray for Matthew and Andrea as they now move into a different stage of their life. So please do hold them in your prayers. A date for your diary? Well, there's a couple of dates. The first one is Saturday the 9th of July. There's going to be a church walk. Please note, normally a Sunday is going to be on the Saturday the 9th of July. More details to follow. Now this is real forward planning. Sat September the 10th, it's a Saturday. Put it in your diary for the Chilton Three Peaks Walking and Social event. Wow, I don't have any more details than that. But please put it in your diary. Saturday the 10th of September. That's it, you'll be pleased to know. 